Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Uh, my guest is Dr. Christopher Estes. He's the co-founder of Miami Beach Comprehensive Wellness Center. I'm going to talk about some of the therapies they offer, like ozone therapy, plasma, stem cells, etc. So, Chris, thanks for coming. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, tell me a bit about uh, your background and how you ended up working you know, or, or co-founding this place, this uh, wellness center. So, my training was actually an OBGYN. I'm a, I'm a board-certified OBGYN doc. And I was always in a tertiary care institutions. So I was at, you know, University of Miami for years. And so I was, you know, used to seeing lots of highly complicated, you know, multiple medical issues type patients, high risk obstetrics and such like that. And, you know, what I kind of saw in our centers was that patients would see like, you know, the best of the best in every specialty, right? Like they go from one specialist to the next and perhaps they'd get a new diagnosis or get a new procedure or put, get put on a new medication. But, you know, our most chronically, complica chronically complicated patients never really seemed to get better and no one really seemed to figure out the root of what was going on. So, you know, I, I, I was a little bothered by that. And also, you know, I had my own personal experiences in our life with my own health and also my wife's health, where, you know, uh, things weren't working in the conventional medical manner. So we set it out on our own to start learning about functional medicine, integrated medicine, other things like that. Now, my wife, she wised up early and went back to school and got her master's in Chinese medicine and acupuncture shortly after she graduated medical school. So I was always a, a firm believer in integrated medicine and then, you know, other forms of healing. I just didn't practice it. When, when your wife wants something, does she needle you about it? <laughs> Actually, you know what? When I need something, I have her needle me. What's that? Yeah, it's good cool. Like, oh, hey, man, my sh honey, my shoulder hurts again. Can you come fix it for me? I've just, I dislocated my shoulder a couple of times in um, nice. sports, sports injuries. And I re, I actually, it's funny, I went to a, orthopedic surgeon and he was like oh no he's like you know the best shoulder surgeon right you know like at, at the university good guy no, i'm not i'm not knocking him or anything but he was like oh no problem man like we'll take you to the or a couple of stitches we'll stitch you right up it'll be no problem you know we'll fix that we'll fix that you know torn labrum right up and i was like can i like try to rehab this thing or you know maybe do something about it he's like oh no it's not gonna work i did acupuncture prp and stem cell injections and now my 
injured shoulder is actually stronger than my one that I didn't injure. So, oh, wow. yeah. You, you, so like these are parts of my personal experience and I'm an OBGYN. So, I mean, I did lots yeah. of surgery. And I had this example with my ankle. I had like water, I guess, behind the perineal tendon on the outside of the ankle. And same thing, the podiatrist was like, oh, we'll chop your leg off and do all this stuff. You'll be fine. And so I went for acupuncture instead. And after like five, six treatments, I was totally fine. So I was like, it's amazing you know, for for orthopedic type stuff. I mean, sometimes you need surgery. Like, you know, if you've got a, some sort of a spinal compression or something like that, where it's like, okay, you're losing strength and function in an extremity. Yeah, you better go get surgery. Like, you know, things just aren't working, but it's always worth a shot to try to rehabilitate things with acupuncture and other injection therapies. And, you know, like our own, like I said, it was part of our own health journey that, that led us to to functional medicine and then developing all the, and then learning about all of these other techniques. I don't want to say develop because I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I've got lots and lots and lots of teachers to thank for the knowledge that I have and the practices that I use and the techniques that I know. It's like, I've just basically went back to school and I've never stopped learning. And that's really the beauty of this too, is that, I mean, I've, I'm in a class every other week going to, you know, multiple conferences a year and every year I'm learning something new, which is fantastic. Hey, just keep reminding your wife of how much you love her as she needles you. You know, that's a <laughs> safety precaution. Exactly. <laughs> well, very cool. Well, tell me about some of the uh, top therapies that you do with the clinic. You know, what do people present with and what kind of therapies do they get matched up with? So the other thing we'd like to say at our Miami Beach Comprehensive Wellness Center, that's a practice that my wife and I own together and run over on Miami Beach, is that we're like the 20th consult. So a lot of people come to us when they've already seen all the other doctors and no one can figure out what's wrong or they've gotten diagnoses and the treatments haven't really worked or like they're looking for an alternative. So we see a lot of what we like to call complex chronic medical illness. So it's things like chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autoimmune diseases. You know, we do a lot of cancer support. So, you know, we do, we'll see patients with all sorts of tumors, chronic pain of various kinds. And then we have other patients who are already well and want to be healthier. So they're coming for, you know, anti-aging and, you know, how do I improve my performance, whether it's cognitive performance or physical performance, athletic. So, you know, we kind of, if you come to our office, it runs the whole gamut, you know, of, 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 uh, of medicine. But if I really had to pick out the things that I tend to focus on or that I really kind of specialize in, I really treat a lot of chronic toxicity. So toxin exposure from environmental toxins like heavy metals, mycotoxins from mold, other environmental toxins. Uh, I treat a lot of chronic infections uh, that would be, you know, things like Lyme disease, Bartonella babesia, Ehrlichia, other sorts of things like that, and chronic viruses. I see lots of chronic viral problems. And a lot of those di diagnoses I mentioned, things like, you know, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia or chronic renal regional pain syndrome, a lot of these things actually are being caused by one of those things. So, or and actually, usually it's not one of those things. One of those things would be, is really not the way to put it. It's usually multiple of those things. So that we put the picture together to figure out all of those underlying causes and then, you know, treat those underlying causes to, to correct the symptoms the patient's presenting with. When you do stem cell therapy, let's say we break it down by therapy, what are some of the common reasons people come for that in a particular, or why would you match them? let's say, to stem cell therapy as opposed to something else? Oh, sure. So, I mean, you know, I, I try to tailor a program for each individual patient, depending on why they present. Stem cell therapies, you know, are, there's a wide variety of types of things that we can use. And, you know, it really depends on the application. Some of the quickest hits on stem cell related products are the orthopedic things. So combining stem cells with PRP and or other products to help rehabilitate joints is a fantastic way to go. You know, and, and it's funny when you say stem cell, it's kind of like saying restaurant, like, oh, we're going to go to a restaurant tonight. Well, you know, is that Italian? Is it, you know, a uh, Indian restaurant? Like, what, what sort of restaurant are we going to? So stem cell products are similar. So we might use something, you know, like an exosome product, which is basically a product that's produced from stem cells that's a cluster of growth factors encapsulated in a small membrane basically that's we call that an exosome where there's no actual cells but there are you know abundant amounts of growth factors that stimulate the immune system and stimulate healing we may also decide especially for joint 
procedures. There are products that are derived either from Wharton's jelly, which is the spongy part of the umbilical cord, or from the placental matrix that are not cellular, meaning like they don't actually have cells in them, but the tissues in them that are spongy, soft, and resilient, the collagens and the other sorts of connective tissue matrix are preserved. And you can use those also injected into joints to help rebuild cartilage, tendon, and ligament. You know, those sort of procedures are, 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 are very useful for folks, particularly in more advanced stages of disease and also people who are high impact. So like your, you know, people who are either performance athletes or people who like to pretend they're performance athletes on the weekend. So like, you know, I, I, I like to go and I, I, you know, I run marathons every now and then, or, you know, I like to like to hit the gym hard or, you know, they play tennis competitively. So folks that they know, like, well, I know I'm going to go back out there and put a lot of stress on my knee. Okay. So you may want to do something that's a little bit stronger than something like PRP and like adding stem cells to the mix is a way to go. Okay. Well, what other therapies or modalities are pretty common? Do you do like diet advice? Is that paired with, with these other therapies or is it more, again, individual therapies and not, not diet? Oh, sure. No, I mean, diet is absolutely foundational. I mean, that's something that we're going to talk about with every person to identify if they have any any need for changing in their diet or if there's diets that are specifically useful for them. You know, so really what I'm going to do with every patient is kind of, you know, list out the map of services that we might offer for them and then kind of guide them through which options might be best. Some people may come in with an idea of something that they really want to do. Like, well, I, I heard about ozone. I really, really want to do ozone. Okay. So, you know, what is it about ozone that appeals to you? And like, is there really a strong indication for you to do it one way or another? So, Really, it's interesting. A lot of these therapies, especially things like, say, ozone therapy, which is one another one of my favorite things that we do, has very broad based application because the ozone therapies treat mitochondrial health. So I know you've had guests on here that talk about mitochondrial health and mitochondria and the, the role that they play in all sorts of chronic diseases. So we can use ozone, particularly blood ozonation, as part of their therapy. One of the things I think that we're particularly good at in our practice is helping people determine the timing of all of these therapies because you want to make sure that you put everything in order. So you mentioned something like diet. Well, okay, if we're going to do, you know, some intensive IV therapies, intensive ozone therapies, other things like that, I want to make sure I get your diet straight before you do that stuff because we can do a great procedure. But if I didn't manage to diagnose you with food allergies that you have, like if you you know need to stop eating gluten and dairy and, and perhaps you know some other things on the list and you go and do a procedure and then you continue eating the inflammatory foods, the procedure is not going to work as well, right? So those are the sort of lifestyle factors that you know we're always going to want to address, whatever they might be. So it's really kind of a one-on-one -on -one choice about things that we do and also what you know what the patient is a good candidate for. It makes sense. Well, now that you mentioned ozone therapy, what is it used for and how is it administered? Sure. So there's, you know, several ways to do ozone therapy. We do two main types. So one is called major autohemotherapy. Major autohemotherapy is a procedure where we draw blood into a sterile single use jar and then we expose it to a mixture of ozone and oxygen gas. And the ozone is delivered at a very precise concentration. The ozone then goes into the jar with the blood and we mix it around inside of the jar with the blood. And what that does is it stimulates reaction inside of the blood that releases a mediator called lipoxide. Now, lipoxides are a variety of compounds that are actually produced by oxidative stress on the membranes of the cells. It's actually a natural thing. It's just the same thing that happens when people exercise. Okay. However, we do it in a large bolus. So you get a bunch of these lipoxides that come out into the blood. And then what they'll do is they stimulate natural processes inside and outside of cells. So the number one target is the mitochondria. So it stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis, regeneration. It encourages mitochondrial ATP production. So all those things are going to help with energy and with detoxification. At the same time, those compounds are also going to neutralize circulating virus and bacteria, as well as neutralize certain antigen antibody complexes. So it lowers inflammation from antibody-driven disease, and it'll decrease infectious burden in a way. The other thing it does is it stimulates the immune system. So it's basically giving the white blood cells a little poke to help them get going so that they'll recognize see circulating virus and bacteria, and then your body actually will help destroy it. So in those sort of circumstances, major autohemotherapy is particularly useful for anyone who's having chronic infection. 
So we use it a lot for our patients with chronic Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, et cetera. We use it a lot for people who've got chronic viral stuff, Epstein-Barr, herpes, HSV, herpes simplex one and two, HHV six. It tend those, but those things uh, tend to respond really well with ozone as part of the equation. And of course, all the toxin exposure, you know, because of the toxins, you know, it, it, since this is improving your mitochondria, all that helps your ability to, to eliminate them. And the other type of uh, ozonation procedure that we do is called EBO, E-B-O-O, or ozone dialysis. Have you heard about ozone dialysis yet? No, what is that? Okay, so this is a little bit newer on the scene in the United States. It was actually developed in Italy in the 1990s and then kind of made its way through Asia, of all things. And it's been practiced in Asia and Singapore in particular since shortly after 2000. So they've got about two decades worth of experience doing this procedure there. It was originally thought that doing the ozone dialysis procedure might be helpful with HIV. However, it didn't show to treat HIV necessarily. However, the HIV patients that did it tended to get healthier overall. But what they noticed was that it was really good for patients with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and chronic non-healing ulcers. So folks were doing the ozone dialysis and like these diabetic foot wounds that weren't getting better just all of a sudden started to heal. And they weren't doing anything else. When you say when you say dialysis, do they do it the same way as dialysis? Like they pull your blood out and then uh, ozonate it and then put it back in your body, and they go through your like a fistula or something in like a dialysis center. Or how does it work? Yeah. So the good news is we don't have to put a fistula. That's really good news because that's a big deal to put a fistula in your arm. You know, that's a that's a pretty significant surgery. It carries with it some risk. But we do use a dialysis filter. So what the process is, we start two IV lines. So we start an IV in one arm and start an IV in the other arm. So that's one sort of limitation of the procedures. You have to have two good veins. If you don't have two good veins, we can't do it. So we put one IV in each arm. Blood comes out of one arm. It goes through a little pump, and then it enters the dialysis filter. That's the same type of filter that's used in dialysis. However, in dialysis, they're going to pass a fluid through the filter that's called a dialysate. And that dialysate actually works to all nitrogenous waste or nitrogen bearing waste out of your blood circulation and then into basically into a waste container. Okay, so it's working to filter your blood basically the same way the kidneys do. So we don't drip any sort of dialysate into it. All we put in is saline with a little bit of heparin. And heparin is a blood thinner, so the blood won't clot in the filter. But as it goes through the filter, we we expose it to ozone and oxygen gas. So there's a continuous flow of a low dose of ozone with oxygen flowing through. And what the filter does is it actually spreads the ozone out across all the blood cells. So if you can imagine when we when we do it, we're doing the regular blood ozonation in the bottle, there's only a little bit of surface area that we could ever possibly swirl around, you know. But inside there, all the blood cells get spread out across the filter. So if you imagine taking a drop of blood and like blowing it across a piece of paper. You spread all the cells out, so all the cells are going to get bathed in ozone and oxygen. So there's a better penetration of the ozone and the oxygen. And then because of the charge of the filter, it's a naturally charged, this a natural phenomenon, the, the fibers of the filter are charged, it's going to attract inflammatory molecules. And it's going to help remove inflammatory mediators, inflammatory cholesterol. It'll remove biofilm particles. These filters have been studied and like they've even found like fragments of yeast and like, you know, traces of heavy metal, all sorts of stuff starts to get sucked out into this filter, partly due to just the fact that it's a filtration unit, also partly due to the fact of the, the ozone interacting with the blood. Then once the blood runs through the filter, we run the clean blood back into the other arm. Okay. So it's it's kind of like the next level in ozonation procedures. We will often combine this with a low dose of chelation a few days before. Chelation helps to mobilize metal from tissues. So if people have issues with heavy metal, we'll give them a small dose of chelation a couple of days before so that there's more metal circulating in the blood. And then more metal will actually be removed in the filter as we do the process. Huh. And again, what, what, what kind of heavy metals do people tend to have and what, what are the... Um effects of these heavy metals. Oh, sure. So, I mean, the most common metal toxins that we see are mercury, arsenic, lead, and gadolinium. Gadolinium is in MRI contrast. And, you know, MRIs with contrast, you know, are done really frequently. And, you know, where we were taught in medical school, it's, yeah, it's metal, but it's no big deal. You're going to pee it out in like two weeks. You know, it's not toxic. You know, it's no big deal. You don't have to worry about giving people gadolinium. Well, that's not exactly true because Gadolinium will bioaccumulate, meaning it will deposit in your organs, in your bones, 
okay, in your kidneys, and people will carry gadolinium around after an MRI, sometimes for years. I, I personally have seen folks who had one MRI four years ago and still had gadolinium coming out in their urine. So it's impressive. That's crazy. One yeah, MRI it's very impressive. So, four years ago. Yeah, from years years prior. No, what What are the effects of mercury, gadolinium, et cetera, like these various heavy metals? I'm sure they're all different. You know, lead and well, all that, but what you know, what are the effects? It's, it's interesting. They're they're similar but different. I mean, the, each of them have kind of you know pathognomonic sort of toxicities, like uh, lead, for instance. You know, lead is highly associated with cardiovascular disease, so that's known, accepted. You can read that on the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. They all agree. Yep. Lead, lead toxicity will give you heart disease. That's not, you know, these these weird integrated medicine doctors telling you this. Mercury too, also associated with heart disease. Mercury also is associated, and mercury and lead both are also associated with neurodegenerative disorders. So Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, okay? They're also known to be associated with autoimmunity. So they can be a trigger for various autoimmune diseases. As far as other symptoms people may get, headaches, chronic pain, or recovery from injuries. Any sort of organ failure can be associated with, with various types of metals and also cancers. Arsenic in particular is a well-documented carcinogen and arsenic we get exposed to in food, air, water, golf courses. Uh, I encourage people don't live on a golf course like they're no, very you, spray. If someone golfs a lot or even works at a golf course, would they get high levels of arsenic in them, do you think? It's possible. It's mm. possible because the pesticides and herbicides that they use, I believe actually it's arsenic, I believe is herbicides, weed killers, or is it pesticides? Oh man, you, you got me here. One of your listeners will know. They'll be like, that guy didn't know it's a pesticide. <laughs> it, it's a, it, but they spray the courses with it in order to keep the grass nice and perfect. If you've ever been on a golf course, you know, like it's not like regular grass that grows in your lawn. Like you got to really keep that turf up to speed. Now there are organic golf courses where they've stepped away from using all these toxic chemicals. But yeah, people who work in agriculture or agricultural fields in general have a much higher burden of toxin exposure. And arsenic is just one of the concerns, not to mention things like, you know, glyphosate and, you know, other organo like organophosphates and such like that. So yeah, working working on golf courses and working in the agricultural world is definitely a high risk job. And I encourage those folks to make sure that they keep their detox pathways well opened and 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 uh, and supplied with the appropriate nutrients. Well I mean, how do you make sure like your your detox pathways are running properly and what if you're one of those people that, you know, you have some kind of uh, error in a particular detox pathway where you can't clear XYZ out of your body. So it builds up. You know, how do you identify something like that yeah. and then treat it? That's an that's an excellent, excellent question. You know, there's lots of testing we can do. And, you know, one of them is looking at the genetics. So we do some of that testing too. We'll, we'll, we'll do um, SNP, SNP analysis, looking at people's detox pathways, particularly methylation pathways, you know, to look and see, are there particular defects in the detoxification pathways that individual might have that would then suggest, well, number one, what sort of nutrient or supplementation would be most appropriate for this individual? Like, is this someone who's really going to benefit from something like glutathione or glutathione precursors like, you know, N-acetyl, N-acetylcysteine and glutamine? Or is this going to be someone who's going to be more benefited by methylation support? You know, so that's stuff like, you know, methylated B vitamins, S-adenosyl methionine, trimethylglycine, those sort of things. And usually it's kind of a combination. There's always multiple lenses that we can use to look at, you know, what sort of support does this individual need? My preferred way is actually to try to measure the levels of toxins. So there's several labs out there that will measure toxin excretion in the urine where we can look, you know, for metals, that one's, you know, those type of tests have been around a long time. And, you know, there's also labs that look at that. So we'll look at metal levels in the urine and we'll also look at other environmental toxin levels in the urine. And if we identify those, we can then kind of reverse engineer it. So if I see a specific type of toxin, I can say, well, we know what sort of pathway that's supposed to be taking. So since you seem to have a lot of it, let's be sure that we supplement that pathway and design treatment mm. specific for it. Okay. Um, any other therapies that are new that you have a little bit of experience with, maybe not a lot, but they seem very promising? That's a great question. I could tell you about one of the newest ones we just started that I'm really excited about. 
and it's been around for a little while. It's just kind of new to us, but it's called IASIS, I-A-S-I-S, IASIS, Microcurrent Neurofeedback. So like this is totally jumping the rails, going from like, you know, detox and ozone and IV therapies and stem cells to microcurrent biofeedback, neuro neurobiofeedback. So, you know, there's a lot of different biofeedback devices out there, and these are all intended to help improve people's brain health. So there's, you know, various ways this can be done by measuring heart rate variability or by using other EEG devices that measure brain waves. Inesis was based on a technology called Lens, L-E-N-S. And the, the thing with lens was you had to do a, like a bunch of leads, a bunch of exposures around the brain, and it was rather cumbersome and took a long time and lots and lots and lots of involvement to do the lens procedures. So this this gentleman named Barry Bruder, who was a lens therapist, said, you know, I think I could do it this easier. What if we cut down the number of leads we use and, and do this on a simpler protocol? And he developed this device called the IASIS device. And basically what it does is if there's reference electrode leads that read an EEG that read the brain waves, and then there are treatment leads which send back a very gentle balancing signal to bathe the brain in a healthy frequency. So basically you take a nervous, anxious, upset, depressed brain and make it calm, relaxed, happy, and healthy. They've got great data about using this device to help treat things like PTSD. Lots of data coming out from soldiers, you know, who've had PTSD, improving symptoms greatly. People who've had issues with addiction, uh, people with anxiety, poor sleep, children with or with autism, you know, improving all sorts of symptoms around there. Now, this device, just to be clear, is it's not FDA approved to treat anything. It's a relaxation device because it falls under the, the category of, you know, biofeedback. However, I mean, I've been very impressed so far with what I've seen with my patients reporting better mood, better concentration and focus and better sleep. And the beauty of it is, I mean, the treatment only takes about 15, 20 minutes. It's literally that. And people feel cool. better, sleep better. And it helps all of the therapies I do work better because when people's nervous system is in a better balance, and I think part of what it's doing is actually improving the balance between the parasympathetic and, nerve and sympathetic nervous system. And the beauty of it is there's no actual exercise the person has to do because you can accomplish all of these things also with meditation, right? No problem. You just go sit on the cushion, close your eyes and breathe, right? But if you try to do that with someone who's, you know, in a really bad fight or flight loop, they have a hard time sitting down and calming themselves and doing these exercises. Whereas with IASIS, you can actually help them get that ball rolling so that those other therapies will work even better. And also that the other medical therapies we're doing will work better as a result of a healthier brain. Yeah, that's excellent. Anything else coming on the horizon that you're you're looking forward to, but it's just not here yet, or is the microcurrents plenty of new stuff to play with? <laughs> That's a great question, man. Like, there's always there's always a new toy I want. Like, right? there's always something new, right? There's always something. Someone's always got a, a new thing to play with. You know, I never get bored of learning new techniques, and even sometimes, I mean, if it's a new technique for me, it might be an ancient practice like homeopathy. I mean, it's funny. I used to kind of scoff at homeopathy, thinking like it didn't. Did it, what am I giving you placebos? Well, that's is that going to help you? Like, how is that going to work? But you know, then I had some experiences with homeopathy prescribed to me by someone who knew what they were doing with homeopathy, and I was like, oh wow, this actually helps. So um, that's another thing I'm we're bringing on board slowly but surely into our practice, which seems to be particularly helpful for a lot of our patients who can't tolerate other therapies, like patients with multiple chemical sensitivity and severe mast cell activation who don't tolerate other supplements. They can tolerate homeopathy, and that actually starts to help their healing process a lot. That and phototherapies too. I mean, I'm always fascinated by phototherapies and you know, red lights, you various frequencies of blue and green lights and things like that. Those are fantastic things. And there's better and better technology coming out for those devices every year. Well, very good. How far of a range can you help people? Do you do any telemedicine? Is it all in person? You know, where's your area of coverage where you can help people? 
Sure. So, I mean, uh, it depends on what we're doing, of course. I mean, telemedicine is great for some basic things and, you know, we can do telemedicine consults. However, you know, I find like the folks who do the best in my practice are those who are able to take advantage of the in-person therapies, you know, whether it's doing various IV therapies or injection therapies or ozone therapies, things like the eye assist. We sometimes also are able to help people find those resources locally. So I would, you know, I can help them start making diagnoses, making supplement and diet plans, lifestyle changes, and then say, okay, now let's see, where are you? You know, and if you're, if you're anywhere near someone who provides ozone, well, why don't you go see if you can get yourself, you know, on a program with them? Because all of those things I mentioned, you know, like the fancy, sexy things like, you know, doing ozone and EBU and all these cool procedures, they really do work best when they're combined with a foundational program. So just popping in to do a blood ozone and then, you know, not doing anything else. It's like, well, okay, that's nice. But if you really want it to work, you need a foundational treatment. So, but our, our primary area is, uh, is folks from South Florida. You know, we're located on Miami Beach. Though here it's interesting, like we have a lot of people who travel, like they're in Miami for a couple of months a year. Then they're, you know, on the West Coast or they're up in California, oh, they're up in New York or, you know, some of them, I have a lot of patients too that go back and forth to Central and South America. So beautiful thing about Miami is like we have a lot of variety. All right. Well, excellent. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast and talking about all these new therapies. And I'm glad that there's places out there like you guys and not just the, the traditional, you know, medicinal approach, which I think has a lot to learn from these alternative therapies. So, you yeah, know, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.